Hi, Heather. Hi, Rosa. Welcome to bloggingheads.tv. Thanks. It's great to have you here, um, and I'm excited to have another uh, woman who focuses on far, foreign policy issues on Blogging Heads. There's been a, a, a shortage of us here. So I'm glad to have you enough. on board. Um, Heather, uh, you are, let me start by, maybe we could talk a little bit about, about you and your background so that people who uh, are watching this can can get a sense of where you're coming from. Uh, you are officially speaking. You are my co-blogger at Democracy Arsenal, although you are a, a, a much much better blogger than I am since I've been sort of shamefully uh, remiss about blogging lately. Um, but but there are lots of interesting things about you. Um, one of which is that you live in Michigan, which has a lot to do with how I came to be a blogger. Okay. Because I can actually hide in my office and have time to blog. I, I actually think we should congratulate her. I know we're not supposed to be self-congratulatory, but blogging is hard. Blogging is very hard, which is why it turns out that it's hard. I can't do it. And, the, I mean, I look at these people who sort of do full-time blogs all the time yeah. and say smart things more often than not, and, man, I have no idea how they do it. Well, it's, it's incredibly hard, actually, and, and I often feel like a fraud on blogging heads since I'm not exactly a real blogger. Um, but I, I don't know how they do it because to be a really good blogger, it seems to me that you, you, have, to, you have to have both a lot of free time and, uh, I don't know how to put this in, I mean this in a nice way, actually. <laughs> you, you need to have a slightly obsessive quality. Yeah. Well, the thing is, though, I mean, you do the weekly column, which is hard in a similar, though not exactly the same way. So I, I think you deserve full credit. But well, the, no, well, the, thing, the thing about blogging is that, that I have no trouble kind of coming up with a dozen ideas, you know, things I, I just I would love to sort of sound off about mm -hmm. every week. But the time to actually do the research and put lots of little links in them and frame my thoughts in a way that I think anyone else might believe them. Right. Although some of that, I think, is actually a kind of funny generation gap thing, and, and this is it's one of the first times I found myself on the wrong side of this, but I think I worry a lot more about um, sort of writing my posts as if they were research papers right. than right. Right. most bloggers do. <laughs> well, I, th I think that's true. You don't want to get it wrong, and I, I feel the same way. I feel like I, I sometimes hear people say that in blogs you can just toss off your random thoughts, but... but and maybe some people do, but it's always I, – I don't get the sense that people like Kevin Drum or, or you know, Matt Iglesias are just tossing off their random yeah. thoughts, nor well, certainly when I read your posts and posts of our colleagues on Democracy Arsenal. You know, people have to do a lot of research to get it right, which isn't something that you can just do in your spare five minutes. I, w when I look at blogs, it's, and I do every now and then, I look at things like Instapundit, that I can much more understand how somebody could do it in their in their spare time because they largely consist of, you know, a link and a sentence or two saying something like, you know, another outrageous thing or this is funny, ha. And well, okay, you know, I, I, I could do that and, and that's it, that's not useless. I mean it's it, it, it is it's potentially helpful to people to assemble in one place that kind of you know, links that might be of interest to a particular community, but but making the kind of, I, I mean, what you're really doing in, in, in a blog like Democracy Arsenal is you're writing, like, mini columns to some extent. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, the other thing that I think is extra hard for us on national security is that you're actually kind of all the time you've spent in the field, you're painfully aware that what you write has broad ramifications. And so you don't just think about, well, you know, will people believe what I write? Mm -hmm. Is this correct? Is this going too far out on a limb? But you also think... Does this have ramifications in other places? Um, do I want five years from now to be traveling someplace and be introduced as, oh, this is the person who wrote the incendiary, you know, anti, I don't know, anti Sarkozy blog post five years ago, for well, example? Well, okay, that's that's. Let me let me pick up on a couple of pieces of that, though. I mean, I mean, are we first of all, are we kidding ourselves? Are are are, are that many people? or that many people who matter actually reading this stuff, do we think? <laughs> um, you know, there are kind of two answers. Like, the generic answer to that is no. Uh -huh. I mean, at any given moment, you know, everyone is doing what they're doing, and right. what is Democracy Arsenal? On a good day, we get a 1,000 readers, so no. 
But what I at least, and I mean, again, but, this may just hurt me. But every single one of those thousand or the thousand people you're going to bump into on your next foreign <laughs> trip, and they're all going to be really mad at you. So. No, no, I wasn't <laughs> going to be quite that paranoid. Right. But the thing that makes this medium so different is that it's both perishable in that, you know, mm -hmm. sort of your thoughts are at the quick, just toss them off perishable level. But the medium's not perishable. So, you know, for example, people who are seeing right. this right. and, you know, are like, who the heck is that person Rosa is talking to are sort of going off and Googling me. And then you do that and you find sort of anything you've ever said right. about anything. A, a hilarious thing I did, and I always get in trouble for this, is a long time ago I read Peggy Noonan's autobiography, What I Saw at the Revolution. Mm -hmm. And I love recommending that to people. It's a great book. She wrote it before she went all crazy and started writing that, you know, Jesus sent dolphins to save Aelion and that kind of thing. And it's just a wonderful kind of political coming-of-age story, right. even though it's it's not a political philosophy I have any sympathy for. And it's a great portrait of, of what life is like in the White House. And so I always tell sort of young, aspiring politicos to read it. But... Lo and behold, at one point, like a third of the citations for me on Google were right-wing bookstores saying, see, even liberals like this book. Right, right. And I thought, well, God, I'm never going to recommend that again. <laughs> well, I wouldn't feel too bad. I mean, so, but I do think, like, the, the thing that I always sort of strikes me as so odd about blogging, especially in the realm of, of national security, which is so stuffy, right. um, is that... Everybody who's younger than we are thinks that having all kinds of stuff up on the web is completely normal. Right. And everyone right. who's older than we are thinks it's completely bizarre completely and grounds for dismissal from your job. Well, that, that's the other thing I wanted to pick on, actually, is, is to pick up on from what you were saying earlier, is that, that it seems to me that there are bloggers who see themselves as part of the media, in a sense. Mm -hmm. You know, they're not fundamentally policy people. They're part of the new media. Yeah. Uh, and, yeah. and precisely what that means and what their relationship is to old media and what their relationship is to other institutions is, is very much in flux, uh, obviously. But they, they see themselves as uh, observers, commentators, people who certainly hope to shape the debate and, and, and by doing so to shape policy, but they don't, I, I think, and obviously this is an overgeneralization, they don't see themselves as people who will occupy future policy positions in government jobs, for instance. Um, whereas in Democracy Arsenal uh, and some similar blogs, uh, you know, um, some of the TPM Cafe stuff, uh, et cetera, I can think of others. Um, Washington Note. Right, precisely. Uh, they are people who whose self-identity isn't primarily that I'm a commentator and I'm part of the media, new or old, or, or a little bit of both. Their, their identity is, I'm a policy person, whether it's domestic policy or foreign policy, national security issues, and I am <laughs> reduced to commenting on this blog <laughs> because my, my political party is out of power, so I, I don't have the capacity to be sitting there at the Defense Department, the State Department, or the National Security Council, or wherever it might be, uh, or the Justice Department, uh, doing stuff. Um, so I'm going to sit here and, and you know, let's be charitable. I'm a, uh, I was going to say snipe from the sidelines. But I'm going to sit here and make constructive suggestions for what, you know, the next administration ought to be thinking about this one would be doing if it were not so diluted. Um, and then, you know, when things change, I'm going to drop this blog, you know, like a hot potato, and I'm going to race off to, to, you know, send my resume to the transition team, and, and, and off I go, goodbye blog. And I feel like we need to stop and reassure our Democracy Arsenal fans that, um, that Democracy Arsenal will not disappear quite that fast. Okay. Okay. <laughs> Well, and, and I don't, I'm, 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 I'm caricaturing this a little mm -hmm. bit, right? Mm -hmm. But yeah, uh, it's very real. But, but, but I think that's probably right, that, that all of us on Democracy Arsenal at least came to this originally, not through seeing ourselves as part of the media in one way or another, but through seeing ourselves as policy people looking for an outlet when obviously government is not an option for the time being. Right. And well, how does that alter what our role is and what we say and, and how people react to us? I think there's one other piece that at least I, it's one of the more fulfilling things I find about the site, is the opportunity to communicate on national security with mm -hmm. an audience that is more interested in this set of issues than people have been maybe in our lifetimes. 
and has kind of, there's so few avenues for mm-hmm. Americans, even, you know, or especially sort of the the well-educated armchair foreign policy people, as I, as I think of mm-hmm. the people who read our blog and comment on it most vigorously. Right. Right. There are so few avenues to have sort of talk about that that's not either very simplified, you know, smushed into a, a two-minute NPR item or a 20-second network news item or or grossly partisan in a way that you know, we can be quite partisan on democracy arsenal, but we occasionally manage neutrality. Us. So, so I see as, you know, I, what I like about it is that there's also a genuine, um, I try not to use pompous words like educational, but there's just a real opportunity to, it's another way to reach an audience that's really hungry for better information and smarter dialogue mm-hmm. on international issues than you get through the media. Well, are we, are we um, unintentionally doing ourselves in uh, if we eventually want some kind of high-powered government jobs? Heather, here, here's a paranoid fear of mine, and you alluded <laughs> to this earlier, talking about how we're a little bit in between generations, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, we're about the same age. Um, the, some of our younger co-bloggers, uh, you know, who grew up on, on IMs and blogs and so forth, uh, don't think twice about this medium um, you and I, at least initially, were, were you know, we, we sort of, uh, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm experiencing a phasia, I can't think of the right term, but, but we, you know, we grew up in an era in which if you were interested in any kind of government role, you watched what you said. Yeah. And, and you watched how you said it, too, because if you were too snarky and too sarcastic, even if you were saying all the all the substantive things that your your friends agreed with, you would get a reputation as being a little too much of a wise ass and a little too difficult to control, and nobody was going to want you in, in their administration. That's for sure. Uh, and 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 do you do you ever worry about that? Do you ever worry? Here I am putting myself out here and you know making smart ass comments and and I'm risking something. Well, I mean, yes, because I I have had at least one client who where they went out of their way to let me know that somebody from the office was checking the blog every now and then. So it's not so much a worry as a fact. Right. Now, having said that, th- this is going to sound very funny, but the thing I kind of compare it to is the moment in the early 90s when the rules about drug use and government mm-hmm. jobs changed. Mm-hmm. Um, I don't know if you remember, but up until the late 80s, admitting that you had ever used a controlled substance was grounds for not getting a security clearance and consequently never being able to work in the State Department, the Defense Department, the White House. And that changed in the, um, I think it had started to change even before the Clinton administration Mm -hmm. actually, you know, jokes Mm -hmm. about inhaling aside. Um, And I had a college classmate who the funny thing is got caught in the change because he lied to the investigators um, because that was what he had been told he should do. And one of his um, right. friends or doormates or somebody they interviewed said, oh, yeah, he smoked pot every now and again. Right. And they came back to him and they said, well, the fact that you lied is a problem right. and denied right. him the clearance right. and thus the job. Um, but, you know, by by the mid-'90s, um, you know, people, sort of square people like me who actually came in and said, no, I never have smoked pot. I think I had more trouble with the clearance process. <laughs> because they said, oh, come on. Yeah, they were like, yeah, you're right, you never smoked pot, really. Right. Um, my husband had a, a boss who um, had a fairly senior job at the energy department, and they, they asked him, they said, you know, have you ever used controlled substances? And he said, oh, I smoked pot in grad school. And he said, how many, they said, how many times? And he said, well, let me see. It took eight years to do my graduate degree, and there are 365 days in a year, and came up with some incredibly high number, to which they then called this guy's colleagues and said, can you substantiate that Dr. So-and-so smoked pot X thousand times? <laughs> right, right. So yeah, to, 252 to, times. To steer this discussion back to higher ground, um, <laughs> I suspect well, I, that within a decade, um, Youthful indiscretions on the web will be like smoking pot in college. So within a decade, you and I will be able to be confirmed as, as secretary, co-secretaries of state, despite the photographs of us dancing nude while singing on the Internet. Hey, the photographs of dancing nude didn't hurt George Bush, so I don't okay. see why they should hurt us. <laughs> well, that's reassuring, because uh, I'm going to post mine later today. Um, <laughs> well, okay, All right. we really better change the subject now, actually. Um, uh, let's go back to something you said. Uh, let's go back. To, let's go back to the fact that you live in Michigan. Right. Um, and and 
where, where you have lots of time to blog because, um, well, why? Why do you have more time to blog in Michigan? Well, whenever I had I had been in Washington for a very long right. time, and I'm a total Type A workaholic personality, right. and I always had either in the Clinton administration or in mm-hmm. various think tanks and nonprofits the kind of job that you're in the office all the time, and when you're not in the office, you're thinking about it. And, and, and just just for our viewers, you you worked as a as a speechwriter at the State Department, as a speechwriter for President Clinton. Yeah, and out of government at the International Crisis Group and at the Carnegie Endowment, and then um, I, I sort of. You know, I had I had my malaise moment with Washington, and it conveniently coincided with my husband getting his dream job with the United Auto Workers out here. So, we didn't, I'd never lived in Michigan before; I had no ties to it. But it actually, for what I now do, which is mostly sort of explaining to policy wonks how to talk to regular Americans and explaining to regular Americans what the hell the foreign policy wonks are on about, it's actually been the best thing that ever happened to me to to come out here. I mean, in part because I got to skip. You know Washington during during much of the Bush years, which I think is a is a net positive, right? right. Um, and because we spend time with just an enormous range of people from really different right. backgrounds, and if someone says, "What are you working on?" I have to think about, right. okay, can I explain this in three sentences? And if I can't explain it in three sentences, then what am I doing? So it's so, it's a great discipline, and it's a wonderful. You know, anytime I'm on a conference call and I want to do something slightly obnoxious, I pipe up and say, "Well." You know, if you want the outside the beltway perspective. Right, right. And I once got into a wonderful fight with David Frum, and, you know, any excuse you have to get into a fight with David Frum can't be bad. Um, we were doing a Radio Collins show about the State of the Union a few years back, and I was trying to explain that, um, yes, Americans still worried about terrorist attacks, and I had, you know, friends who wouldn't send their kids to Washington on the class trip, and. Right people who were worried about the University of Michigan football stadium being targeted and all this kind of thing, but that really there wasn't the level of intense fear that I find people still have in New York and Washington, you know, for, for good reasons, but right. the assumption that everybody in the country was as afraid as, you know, someone walking through downtown Manhattan might be just wasn't right. And from a doctor, this very patronizing tone to me and said, Heather, even in Michigan, people understand that the terrorists are out to get us or something like that. And I said, even in Michigan, David? What, do you think we're dumb out here? So, you know, I must say I've really enjoyed um, having a little more mental space to do things like like that. I I, I used to be able to do things like that when I, I, I... I taught for five years at the University of Virginia in Charlottesville, and I lived in a very, very small town about uh, 10 miles outside of Charlottesville uh, called Free Union, a population of about 2,000 people. <laughs> and it used to be very satisfying to pull out my, my central Virginia red state credentials, uh, often with my, my, my liberal friends, uh, saying, uh-huh. well, let me tell you what it's like here in the heart of the red, reddest part of the red state. Uh, but I can't do that anymore because right now I'm in New York, unfortunately. No. And it's a funny thing about college towns and college areas, too, that you get this, m- uh, I mean, because I, <laughs> I should fess up that I live in Ann Arbor, Right. Um, that you get this mix of sort of a very liberal environment in some ways and a very just kind of small town mm-hmm. wherever you happen to be environment at the same time. Yeah. Well, so... To- what what to what extent um, I'm sure there are many ways in which the the political discourse in Michigan is different from the political discourse uh, in New York City in Washington D.C. What are the issues that you know when you when you're talking to neighbors when you're just talking to you know when you're chatting with the checkout person at the supermarket what are the things that people are worried about there that maybe are different from the average person's conversation topics here. Well, I think the thing, I mean, the first thing you have to say is Michigan has the highest unemployment rate in the country. Michigan and the states hit by Katrina were the only states whose economies didn't grow in 2006. Mm -hmm. Michigan has fewer industrial jobs than at any time since they started counting how many industrial jobs the state has. Because of the collapse of the auto industry and thus the accompanying collapse of the parts industry and so on, the the economy is just in free fall here. Mm Mm-hmm. And that has created a huge generalized sense of anxiety, which, you know, comes out in budget debates and taking money back from the schools and soaring public Mm -hmm. university tuition Mm -hmm. and um, a lot of, I think, fears around ethnic and racial issues. Michigan passed an anti-gay marriage law. Michigan Mm -hmm. passed an affirmative action ban. 
both things that I frankly think wouldn't have happened if the economy had been better. You, I did, um, I did advocacy calling on uh, against both of those, and you would talk to people who who were kind of embarrassed to tell you right. that, that they, you could tell that they were going to vote for these things, but they didn't right. want to tell you, and so they knew on one level that maybe this wasn't the right way to treat our neighbors, right. but that at the same time it was a way of expressing this intense anxiety about a way of life that was really a, a pretty good, you know, you could get out of high school, go to work in an auto plant, um, work hard enough to own your own home, um, buy a boat or a vacation home up north, send your kids to college, you had a pretty good public university system, mm -hmm. and there's a way in which people never wanted to leave that behind. Um, so I already, when we moved out here five years ago, um, it felt a little strange to me, and now, you know, the, the level of, of mm -hmm. despair is, is getting pretty high in, in some places. Um, the question of, of Iraqi refugees, which you'll have your own human rights law perspective mm -hmm. on, you know, from, from the perspective that you and I share, it's shocking and, and awful that the U.S. has done so little to resettle right. any, really, refugees from Iraq, that finally there was an outcry about it earlier this year. The U.S. agreed to take 25,000, which is, I believe, about a tenth right. of the total that the international community has identified. Of those, I think they first said they were going to resettle 7,000 this year, and now they're only going to manage about 2,000 before the end of the fiscal year in um, mm -hmm. September. Michigan has the, the largest Middle Eastern community mm -hmm. in the United States. Right. Mostly and Detroit? Um, Detroit and the suburbs around it. I mean, folks came to work in the auto industries. Mm -hmm. So, but it's like a total of 90 families. Mm -hmm. And you had this crazy thing lately where the mayor of Warren, which is a pretty large um, suburban Detroit city in its own right, um, sent out this scary press release announcing that 15,000 Iraqis were shortly going to be descending on right. Warren. Right. And, you know, it was a kind of classic... Um, old school, let's scare people. And but in this economic environment, right. you could just imagine the effect that would have. Right. So you know, you see, just um, really moving. You used to have, um, actually, before the war in Lebanon last summer, you had a uh, Jewish and Arab communities here that had started really working closely together mm -hmm. on civil liberties issues, and suddenly they can't talk to each other anymore. Um, there was one great interview I read about someone, a, an Arab American, who had shown up at a demonstration at a synagogue wearing a mask. And the reason he was wearing the mask was that he didn't want his Jewish friends to see him at the demonstration, but he felt sort of compelled to go out and, and make his position known at the same time. So it's, it's a very bizarre way that these issues come home mm -hmm. to roost here. Um, the, the two other things are, one, that, that I see... People talk a lot about fear and how this administration has used fear very effectively. I mean, I think fear is how they got Bush over the top in 04. But what you really see in Michigan and what I suspect is true in other places is that people have developed an enormous generalized well of anxiety mm -hmm. um, that has to do with terrorism and the feeling that people around the world hate us and are out to get us and that their relatives in the military are in harm's way. But it also has to do with economic fear. Right about jobs and, you know, what on earth are their kids going to do for a living. And I think people in their daily lives don't differentiate that well of fear. Right. And right. then that leads you to a, a lot of results that are maybe kind of unpleasant or unexpected in elections, given what people say their foreign policy preferences are. And I just right. think being here, I, you get that at a much more fundamental level when you see kind of the things people are assaulted with right. and you know, not to harp on the media and national security coverage, but how few tools a normal person actually has to sort any of this stuff out. So people feel a lot of terrible economic and cultural anxiety about being vulnerable, being displaced, and that just gets sort of transferred to some extent to the national security issues, even when, even when it may be less realistic to attach the fear to that, and then they, they vote based on the anxiety. Yes, th and there's actually been some communications research sort of looking at the main storylines that people see on, on local news about mm -hmm. global issues. And it's mm -hmm. almost always something bad is happening there, and we're right. staving it off here. Right, right. So there well, is kind of this one storyline that covers everything. Is this, is, this, is this something that you think are... 
the Democratic foreign po policy establishment, which which you're obviously part of, uh, as well as being part of a part of a different culture, is that is that establishment tapping understanding this correctly, or just totally missing this? And and, and maybe more specifically, what about the d the major Democratic front runners? Uh, are they getting this set of anxieties, or are they missing it completely? Well, it's funny you should ask that um, because I think. They, you know, Clinton, Obama, and Edwards all get it in different ways. Right. Um, and this is this is maybe the moment to say that that um, I'm a big Clinton person, and I have mm -hmm. worked for Hillary in the past, and hope to do so again. And I'm a huge fan, and I know, I know you're an Obama person, and I think I and I. It's a little funny for me to talk about things I've worked on, but I do think that Senator Clinton gets the mm -hmm. the middle class anxiety mm -hmm. issue really, really well. And that, I think, is one of her core strengths. It's, it's where she comes from. It's the kind of small business people. And she speaks to that very eloquently and very naturally. Um, Obama, I mean, and Edwards gets the sort of working class, falling off the edge, poverty piece of it. Mm -hmm. um, and Obama gets the kind of how can we make globalization work piece very nicely, mm -hmm. the kind of we're part of a bigger community and we need to to hook into that, and he right. speaks to right. that right. very beautifully. But, you know, it's an interest, and, and each of them does some of, of the other one's things. Right. But, you know, Obama got himself caught. This was fascinating to me. He came here and gave a speech to the Detroit Economic Club on climate change. Mm -hmm. And what the campaign clearly intended to do, and for the national media mm -hmm. succeeded in doing, was to have kind of a Bill Clinton sister soldier moment with the auto industry and right. say, look, you guys, you're part of the problem. You have to accept right. higher fuel standards, et cetera, et cetera. And people here, you know, people know that. Um, right. People aren't happy about it, but they know it. But Obama infuriated the, the, the Michigan, the, the unions, and the environmental community. I was so surprised to hear sort of local environmental people saying, you know, what was he thinking? that he gave this whole speech and never once, sort of specifically about the auto industry, and never once mentioned the unions at all. Me never once mentioned, the, I'm sorry, what? The, um, the, the role of the unions, the unions. here. Uh -huh. So he was like, okay, well, that's kind of interesting, but if you hope to win any Democratic primaries in Midwestern states, mm -hmm. um, and apparently he did, you know, this whole opening of the speech, and this is where I get into my old speechwriter thing about... Um, the sort of great history of Detroit and the civil rights movement and the, the many, many contributions that were made here, which, of course, um, there was a lot of union involvement in. And so apparently people just left really steamed saying, hey, he didn't even make a, a ritual nod to us. Mm -hmm. And, you know, the realities of Democratic Party politics is that there are a lot of people you have to make nods to. And I think where, to go back to your question, where the establishment gets so caught up on this issue is that, you know, globalization is working great for me, I have to say. Um, you know, I can sit in my office in Michigan and we can have this conversation with this funny little video camera. And then, you know, I can go to Trader Joe's and buy cheap organic vegetables imported from China and watch a million different movies on TV and, you know, so on and so on. It's just, it's working great for us. But, and, and there's also the reality that it's not going away which, frankly, we haven't done a good enough job. You know, there's been a lot of pretending that, oh, we can just fix this and you can get your, you know, $30 an hour jobs back, which isn't going to happen. Mm -hmm. So the establishment is partly at fault for sort of ignoring the seriousness of the problem and also sometimes, and I, I'm afraid this Obama event is an example of it, of, of not, um, not seeming to recognize that everybody doesn't experience it the same way that we do. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. But I do think, I mean, I do think I come down squarely with the establishment in terms of we can't turn this around. You know, protectionism isn't an answer. The global market is now too large, a spigot, and American industry is too dependent on it for it to be turned off. Well, that's what I was going to ask. I mean, is this... Is this is the problem here that Obama was being tone deaf and, and yeah. didn't, didn't realize yeah. that he needed to that he needed to couple what he was saying with a message that also said, "And I hear you that this hurts where you're sitting, yeah. and I hear you that that you know it's not good enough for me to just sit here and say, hey, deal with it, folks, and look at these good things and so forth, and you know get over it.'" 
um, or, 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 is it, or is this an issue where, where the policy is wrong? Well, um, I'm not going to you know, say that Obama's policy is wrong. The party as a whole, I mean, it, a fascinating thing, I think, about mm-hmm. um, international economic policy is there's right. a sense that, as we do on some other issues, liberals have gotten very trapped by trade orthodoxy right. as if right. we kind of have to prove that we're serious. Trapped, trapped by the Clintonite approach, the, the sort of Bill Clintonite approach to trade orthodoxies, or, or what do you mean when you the say Bill that? Cl- well, you know, the funny thing is mm-hmm. even Bill Clinton's approach um, was somewhat controversial. I remember sitting in a meeting, um, one of the first things I did when I got to the White House, where cabinet members actually got into an argument about whether sort of responding to the Seattle protesters was a good idea right, or not. And, right. you know, Clinton's personal instinct was to say, hey, we hear you, these issues are real, right. we need to respond. Right. And there was a, a um, very prominent segment of the Clinton administration that just sort of was like, hey, we should ignore those and, mm-hmm. you know, they'll go mm-hmm. away and just expanding trade is all that really matters. Right. right. And, I, you know, there's a real sense in which progressives are kind of hesitant to say, actually, and, you know, economists, there, or there are economists who are much more flexible and saying, okay, you know, you need to, you need to couple your trade agreements with better built-in protections mm-hmm. for workers who are hurt. You know, you can have labor and environmental standards, and actually, it won't do yeah. anybody any harm. Yeah. Yeah. You know, this business of patent protection. I mean, the Council on Foreign Relations of all places has written this series of reports on how the kind of very, very strong patent protection, you know, Mickey Mouse mm-hmm. must never, ever go into private hands, mm-hmm. how those laws are really hurting, in some ways, American industry, even though we're the ones who right. insist on them right. so strongly. Right. It is, you know, what's interesting to me, and I, 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 I have to say, I'm, I'm not at all an expert on issues of trade and economic globalization. I mean, in, indeed, it's an area in which I, I know very little. Um, so I, I say this with some hesitation, but it seems to me that one of the one of the, the, the sort of the difficulties that 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 both the democratic establishment and others maybe have in unraveling some of the sort of quote unquote anti globalization sentiment is that there are there are two very radically culturally different constituencies that make up that movement and one of them is the constituency that that is that is more cosmopolitan and radical and is worried about worker rights in Mexico and, uh, you know, child labor in Bangladesh and, and what happens to labor standards and rights in foreign countries and is worried about fairness, global fairness to some extent, and worried that, that the, the rhetoric and, and the policies of free and fair trade often end up meaning sort of predation for, for uh, workers and, and for the environment in countries that, that have less capacity to essentially defend themselves against the market. Uh, you know, against the untrammeled market, um, and that that group culturally tends to be an educated, sophisticated, cosmopolitan group of people. Um, and then the other group, of course, is the group that you were referring to earlier. You know, these are the Michigan auto workers who are freaked out because their 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 jobs have disappeared, their industry has disappeared. Iraqis are moving in next door to them. The world doesn't look like it used to look, and it's a very scary place, and they don't know quite what to do, and nobody seems to care anymore about them, and everybody's just sort of shruggy and saying, hey, you know, suck it up, go get some job retraining. You know, why don't you learn how to, you know, work in an Internet, you know, hotline call-in center or something, and they're saying, well, you know what, this isn't, this isn't what I thought was going to happen to my life. This isn't what I want in my life. This doesn't look very good to me. You know, it's not that easy, folks, to just pick up and radically alter your life and say, forget the $30 an hour job, I'm going to take the one that's $8 an hour now and just deal with it. And, and, and one of the difficulties is that, you know, culturally speaking, as, as you were, I mean, maybe, the, the, okay, this is, this is a hypothesis, right? Maybe, maybe this is totally wrong, but, but that, that, that second group, uh, as you were saying earlier, that, that that set of economic anxieties sometimes gets lumped in with a kind of, with a kind of xenophobia that says, you know, we don't want those Iraqi refugees. You know, it's us or them. You know, and, and while we're at it, you know, let's let's vote against gay marriage because anything that feels like a threat to to an older way of life and older assumptions gets kind of lumped in together with the same with, with a set of fears that is more that is about economic and cultural dislocation at its root. And so those folks don't actually culturally have a whole lot in common with the people who are saying this is no fair because what about the kid in the sweatshop in Bangladesh? Uh, and yet they're obviously, you know, both 
making common cause, but how do you talk to both of those groups at the same time in a rhetoric that will be, it, 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 in a way that addresses both concerns simultaneously? Is that, is that, is that an accurate account? Um, I mean, I think it's possible to grossly overdo mm-hmm. the sort of the culturally different mm-hmm. stereotypes. Um, and I always tell people about the first party we threw after we moved out here was a bunch of guys from mm-hmm. my husband's office, and I'd been hearing a lot about one of his bosses who had put in 30 years in a plant, blah, 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 blah. And so, you know, we're at this party, and we have beer, and one of the things that you have to do is you have to serve beer that's brewed by UAW organized workers. Right. Um now, I'm going to get in big trouble if I get this wrong, but I believe that uh, your choice is Miller or Leinenkugel. So anyway, we have our you know, oh, culturally man. appropriate beer and whatever, okay. and we have all these people. And a guy in penny loafers and a little sweater comes up to me and says, do you have any white wine? And I'm thinking, huh, this must be one of my husband's University of Michigan friends. Okay, sure, I go and get some white wine. And a while later, Darius says to me, Heather, have you met my boss? Mm-hmm. And I'm like, oh, that's the 30? Okay, well, I'll get that stereotype right out of my right. mind. Sure. So yeah. there's some truth to it, but yeah. um, somewhat less than I think yeah. we establishment types tend and to think. The other thing, actually, that's happened that's been very interesting in the last four or five years is that both sides of, of the divide you were describing have recognized the need to work with each other. And so you have things like the Apollo Alliance, mm-hmm. who are the, you know, sort of, do alternative energy as if it were the moonshot Mm -hmm. people. Um, And you have a really interesting, there's a a good um, kind of lefty, leftier than me, but really they're well organized and they make good points that I enjoy watching them. Um, Who is it? It's public citizen Mm -hmm. and Mm -hmm. maybe environmental defense. I'm not sure which other groups, but they they do trade calls, critiquing trade agreements from both labor and environmental mm-hmm. perspectives for mm-hmm. journalists, which we get invited onto because of the blogs. Right. So right. you have, actually at the advocate, at the upper advocacy level, you have a lot of cross-pollination now. Mm-hmm. What I don't see anybody doing very well is taking that cross-pollination out to the rank and file and saying, look, the tree huggers are your friends. Right, right, right. And right. you saw that here, um, Move On staged a protest at our congressman, John Dingell, the longest-serving member of Congress and chair of the Energy and Commerce mm-hmm. Committee, staged a protest at his office about the um, the CAFE standards, the fuel efficiency mm-hmm. standards, and the UAW sent out some folks for a counter-protest, and apparently it, it very nearly came to blows in kind of classic, um, you know, 70s fashion. And right. that was frustrating to right. me. That didn't need yeah. to happen, and at sort of at upper levels, both sides understand that they need to work together. But again, as you were saying, when... When people have so much anxiety and yeah, so few legitimate yeah. ways to, to blow it off, it, it gets blown yeah. off in um, culturally inappropriate or insensitive or outright xenophobic ways. No, and I and I I've, I've, I should say I, you know I have actually maintained a kind of willful ignorance on these issues in part because I feel a little bit conflicted. I, I grew up in a in a in a union family. My my stepfather yeah. is a union organizer. Uh, you know, from a very, very blue-collar background, uh, and he still is a union organizer, in fact. Um, uh, uh, and I, my own early career was in for human rights NGOs, uh, so, so I, I very much can see both pieces of that. Yeah. Uh, you know, both see very much the, the concern about, uh, about international worker rights uh, and... and very much see myself as a global citizen, but also feel very rooted at the same time in some in some deep awareness of of you know actual American communities in which people you know th- that that's an abstraction what's going on in the rest of the world and the reality is, is people struggling to pay the bills and you know uh, places where they used to work closing down or or shifting them over to contract work or temp work or something like that and and it's and it and it it is such it is such a hard issue i think i've sort of steered clear of it just because i i i i don't have the i don't have the first notion what a satisfactory solution is which is which is actually why i'm going to leave it to you to sort it out well in an optimistic mode i'll mm-hmm. say that i think there's a possibility that in 10 or 15 years actually the movements are going to be much more closely connected. The labor movement, I mean, is going to look very different than it does now mm-hmm. or, or more to the point than it did 20 years ago. Um, the parts of the labor movement that survive and are successful are going to right. be much more internationalized. Right. Um, you know, you see that with what Andy Stern is doing right. at the SEIU, and you also saw it with the, the recent sale of Chrysler, hmm. that there was real um, sort of interplay and cooperation between the 
UAW here in the States and the German unions that, um, that are represented at Daimler, the parent mm -hmm. company, and that was its whole own sort of set of negotiations. Oh, and the Canadian unions as mm -hmm. well, which mm -hmm. split off from the American unions because the Americans weren't radical enough for the Canadians. So there's a whole, I mean, like in so many other sort of areas of American life, the unions that make it are going to be globalized right. and are going to be right. much more savvy with these issues and much more comfortable working with a, a range of interlocutors. And the problem is, again, as it is in, in so many other areas of, of international policy, is how you, how you explain to people who aren't rubbing up against this stuff every day right. and who are constantly, as we said, being told that the world is full of bad, scary stuff out there coming right. to get us, and how you say to these people, well, actually, the only way of saving ourselves is to work with the bad, scary stuff mm -hmm. out there. Mm -hmm. And that's, that's just a huge mind shift for anybody at any stage of life to, well, to undertake. You know, speaking of, let, let, speaking of bad, scary stuff, let, let, me move to a, <laughs> let me move to the topic of uh, George W. Bush, um, actually. Uh, um, and this, this, this isn't just a, a bad segue um, here, but one of the things that we, we actually want to talk about, which, which in some ways is related to what we've been, we've been talking about to some extent, um, you know, to what extent is the uh, Democratic foreign policy establishment sort of missing issues that, uh, you know, people in Michigan, people out there outside of the Beltway, outside of the elites are worried about or, or failing to connect, failing, being tone deaf at least. Um, and, and another possible issue um, is Bush and impeachment. Um, there, I've seen polls are all over the place, but sort of interestingly, um, you know, polls suggest that a strong, large majority of Democratic voters think that George W. Bush should be impeached. Um, as you know, there's been a, a, a bit of a standoff between Cindy Sheehan and, and Nancy Pelosi, with uh, Sheehan threatening to run against Pelosi in California as an independent if Pelosi, as I understand it, doesn't introduce, uh, uh, doesn't try to impeach Bush um, before whatever, I don't know exactly, I don't know precisely the details of this of this story, but, but it's essentially saying, you know, if you don't try to impeach him, I'm going to run against you on, a, on an impeachment platform. Unquestionably, there, there are a lot of angry Democrats who think that Bush should be impeached. The Democratic leadership doesn't want to touch this, right? With, mm -hmm. Not with a 10-foot pole, not with a 10-billion-foot pole. Yeah. Um, is that just stupid of them? Why, you know, when, when so many people, so many Democrats, clearly would love to see it happen, wh what, what's going on? Well, I mean, I, sorry, you said one thing that was so interesting that I'm going to go back for just a mm -hmm. second, and that is if you look at public opinion polling, the three international issues that people are really keyed up about are Iraq, mm -hmm. the economy, and energy security, with terrorism kind of floating in there as sort of connected to Iraq, sort of not. So, sort of, And sort of connected to energy security, yes, I would think. Yes. Yeah, yeah, it's, yeah. It's, it's interesting. It's still not quite clear... This is right. some work I actually do for a project, and, and we're still kind of trying to figure out what people think they mean when they're talking about energy security. Right. But back to Bush and, and impeachment. I mean, I, I guess the way to start this discussion is to say, in an alternative, fair, and just universe, the guy would be impeached already. Uh, I'm sorry, say that again? In, a, in an alternative, fair, and just universe, the, guy, the president would already be in, impeached, he'd be convicted, he'd be gone. Absolutely. Okay, here, here. Uh, so I'm, I'm, I'm totally with that as the ideal outcome, although then you do have to ask yourself, sort of remind yourself how the order of succession works. Ah, uh, yes, ah, uh, <laughs> yes, the, the Dick Cheney problem. So there you, the all, you already Cheney have first, a... Cheney first, Bush second, right? Yeah, okay, yeah. why not? So then Nancy, already... Nancy can get started now on Cheney, and right. then, you know, a couple of weeks later she can get to, she can get to George. Yeah. Yeah. No? But look, if you look back, if you look back, I mean, as, as much as one doesn't want to revisit it, if you look back <laughs> at what happened in the Clinton impeachment, on the one hand, it was a great tool for the Republican base. They all got really excited. Um, however, it boosted Clinton's popularity. Right. And if you remember, it gave Democrats a boost in the 98 midterms. Mm -hmm. And that is exactly what Democrats cannot afford. That, you know, this, this, his popularity is so low, the party's popularity is so low, there's just no reason to give it a boost up. And so you have to ask yourself, is your highest priority to impeach this man or is your highest priority to make sure that his party is removed from the White House in 2008 mm -hmm. and that the Democrats hang on to Congress to give anybody 
just a couple of years of a clean shot to try to wipe away the worst consequences of what's happened over the last eight years. And well, that's I, where I say you have to say, just looking at history, yes, yeah. the base loves it, but there's a group of swing voters that it makes very uncomfortable and that it's like, oh, you're beating up on the guy too much. You know, well, huh. so that's so that's my that's my argument against. Ultimately. Okay, I I agree with that, um, but but there's a but. Um, I I I okay. Here here's what I think. I think I think a uh, George W. Bush uh, thoroughly merits impeachment, uh, and I say that as as a as both both as a citizen and as a law professor. I I think it I think it's it's very easy. It is child's play to make out a very compelling legal case for the, the impeachment of George W. Bush, much, 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 much stronger than the case against Bill Clinton um, ever was or ever could have been, frankly. Um, Rosa, what would you use as your core, core well, well, element? Actually, let me, let me, let's, let, can I, can I just bracket that for a second and come back to that? Mm -hmm. um, but I, I, th I think you could make out a very strong case for his impeachment uh, on, well, uh, Okay, let's not bracket it. Let's just start with war crimes. How about that? Let's just start with war crimes, okay? Uh, let's just start with violating federal law. Let's just start with violating uh, federal law against torture. Let's start with violating federal uh, anti-war crimes legislation. Uh, and then there's the NSA uh, eaves wiretapping program, uh, at, or as it's various being called, eavesdropping program. Uh, let the, and there are a few other things, too, but, but I'll just toss those out there. Um, however, um, uh, I think he thoroughly deserves to be impeached. Um, I also, frankly, think it would be a total waste of time. It's not. I I, th I, I absolutely agree with you that that it would be trying to impeach him would just be red meat to the Republican base. It, it would fire them up. It would make a lot of independents feel like, oh, these Democrats are just vindictive. The guy's already a goner. You know, his, he's 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 more unpopular than Richard Nixon. Uh, why are they just going after him when he's already down? Um, I think that I think that it would also just be a waste of time. The guy is down. He can't do anything. He's a lame duck. You know, there's nothing this man can do anymore, quite frankly. And trying to impeach him, even if the Democrats started, you know, yesterday, it would drag on so long. It wouldn't change a thing in the real world. It's not like impeaching him, you know, starting tomorrow would mean that you know something would magically change in Iraq before the end of the administration anyway. So I think it would just be a huge waste of time. It would be incredibly nationally divisive. It would distract from every other legislative agenda that the Democrats have, et cetera. But here's the but. So I, so I totally am I'm completely with the Democratic leadership for sort of not wanting to go there. But why can't they say what I just said? You know, why do they just pretend that they didn't hear the word impeachment? You know, why do they just look as if there's sort of a bad odor in the room when, when that comes up and, and sort of ignore it? I and mean, this goes back to, your, you know, your, your description of the cabinet meeting where Clinton's cabinet's debating whether or not anybody should actually respond to the Seattle protests. Um, and some Clinton's instinct is to say, you know, I hear your pain, I feel your pain, at least to them, even if he wasn't going to do what they wanted. And other people just wanted to pretend they didn't exist. And it seems to me that what the Democratic establishment is, is doing to, to the base on this is pretending that they don't exist, rather than saying, yeah, you know, you're right, he deserves it, but here's why we're not going to do it. it. And it just seems that they're just making people matter by, by acting as though this is just off, not even something that they should be talking about, and that it's just nasty and vindictive to even think it, much, even if they're not going to do it. There was a great column in Politico last week that came up, I'm embarrassed, I don't remember who the author was, but came up with what I thought was the perfect solution, which was that it should, that Howard Dean should go out and basically say what you just said, mm -hmm. That which I actually thought was a very clever way of um, using a senior Democratic official who has a lot of, of cred with the base. Howard Dean has a lot of cred, oh, with the base, okay, yeah. sorry. Yeah. Uh, now, um, the other thing I have to admit that I wonder about. I want Hillary Clinton to say that. Um, well, it's unfair okay, to no, have she can't. One. She, I know. She's not going to do it. I realize this. Now, if you send all not. three front runners out to do it together, right. that right. would be interesting. Right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, and I, you know, look, I frankly think that Bush's fate in a way is going to be worse than, than to be impeached. You know, I mean, he is going to go down in history, uh, you know, I think as really our all-time worst president. Um, and it's almost more ignominious to be, for people to not even hmm. bother to impeach him. Um you know, so I, I don't, doesn't particularly, I think, I think the harshest judges of all will be time and history, uh, but, 
you know, nevertheless, uh, I would like to see all the Democratic front runners stand up together at a press conference and say, just by the way, you know, we're not going to do anything, but we believe that he ought to be impeached. He merits it. Uh, and because we're nice, we're not going to actually go after you, George. You know, the kid in me who thought about going to law school and never did, there's a small part of me that it's is not bothered. too late. <laughs> that is bothered by the, you know, what does the impeachment statute mean? If, what statute? This is the Constitution. Sorry. Yeah. Yes. I, what does it mean if you, you know, if Clinton got impeached? And so I, I, I have, I, I do find the more I talk about it, the more sympathy with the impeachment people I have. I mean, but, you know, looking forward, if in fact you conclude, as we've been saying, that, you know, there's kind of no point for right. political reasons in, in pursuing this, what do you then conclude that impeachment actually means? Well, I, I, think, I think that to some extent it is accurate to say that, that, you know, while impeachment has a legal component to it, uh, you know, that there's, there's a huge political judgment call. You know, all of the terms are obviously, you know, what is a high crime or misdemeanor? Well, bottom line is it is what Congress thinks it is. Um, you know, Congress is the ultimate, ultimate arbiter of that. Um, you know, and I think that it's obviously was was not intended to be used lightly. Um, you know, I think you can make arguments based on constitutional history. You can make arguments based on original intent. You can make arguments based on the 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 likely outcome, the dangers to the political system of of using it lightly. Uh, no, but I mean, I actually think I think I think that the Clinton impeachment so cheapened mm. it that mm. it is unlikely, certainly mm. for at least a generation, mm. that no matter what god-awful thing an American president does, that any Congress will, will want to risk using it, uh, which I think in some ways is a shame, because I think that, you know, it is easy to imagine situation. well, it's, it's not easy, but, well, but I, can, I can imagine presidents who could be even worse than George W. Bush. I can imagine even worse things. Uh, and I can imagine Congress is still feeling sort of impeachment shy, uh, because of the Clinton impeachment, which is sort of a shame, because it is, it is supposed to be a tool that is there for when a president, you know, utterly, utterly fails in his responsibilities as president in a way that deeply de betrays the public trust, in a way that is non-trivial, in a way that is that is potentially catastrophic for the nation itself, you know. And and I don't think that was satisfied for Clinton at all. I think what he what he did was <laughs> was immoral. You know, I think he should have been ashamed of himself. Uh, I think it was bad. I think it was, you know, I think it was to some extent entrapment, but I think it was illegal. Uh, but I don't think it rose to the level of an impeachable offense. On the other hand, I think that when we're talking about Bush, I think he has endangered the nation in a serious way through his actions. Um, you know, I can think of a president doing worse things than Bush did. Uh, you know, so I think that's what impeachment is supposed to be for, is, is what do you do when you have a kind of out-of-control executive? Um, and I think we're very close to having one right now. I really, I really like the idea of um, senior folks from the party going out and saying these people have sought, have you know, spent years now cheapening the most basic aspects of our democracy, and so we actually we find ourselves unable to use the tool of impeachment in this case, and instead we're going to focus on moving forward and restoring our democracy, mm -hmm. such that in future these words will have meaning again. Yeah, yeah. No, and I, I, I mean, maybe this is a good time to shift to a different topic, um, uh, which is what needs to be, uh, what, what needs to be done to fix America, right? What needs to be done to fix American democracy, both internally and in the eyes of the rest of the world, uh, in terms of restoring American foreign policy credibility and restoring internal American checks and balances, what can be done. Um, we, we, we were thinking of talking a little bit about uh, Iraq and the base, but, but maybe, maybe since we're already close to an hour, we should, we should shift to this instead. I, I sometimes worry that it's, the damage that has been done is almost unrepairable. Yeah. Yes, okay. That I, was I worry about that, too. Um, a more hopeful and positive thing, though. I Before I worked for Madeleine Albright at the State Department, I worked for Warren Christopher. And 
Christopher, as you know, is a, a backroom lawyer by profession, but he's he's one of my heroes because of what he said when he got to the State Department in '03 in '93 that he apparently assembled the senior career staff and said, um, under the previous administration, some of you may have been used to operating somewhat near the ethical line. He said, I don't even want to see the line in my administration. Mm -hmm. And if you if you remember in the, the end of the um, first George H.W. Bush administration, there had been the, all these questions about illegal passport searches and so on at the State Department. And Christopher was really willing to put some of his own prestige and effort into cleaning the place up. Mm -hmm. And I think you're going to you're gonna have to have a bunch of cabinet officials that are willing. I mean, I, I think about what's got to be done at the Justice Department, and I find that just unimaginable. Yeah, right. That's an institution, I think, much more than the State Department, where there's been a kind of a systematic effort to dismantle, uh, you know, internal checks and balances and, and internal norms of professionalism. Yeah. And similarly, I think the Pentagon is yeah. so demoralized and has been used in such odd ways, and political appointees have been inserted in such odd ways, and outsourcing has been done in such odd ways, that that's a place that there's going to have to be a huge amount of healing, both within the uniformed military and in the relations between them and the civilian defense bureaucrats. You know, state... State is a little different because um, Colin Powell, in particular, you know, really put a lot of effort mm -hmm. into personnel and um, civil service stuff. His his term there, and at this point, with all the ideologues in retreat, actually, career officers are are occupying some fantastic jobs. Well, state, ironically, uh, precisely by virtue of having been so marginalized, yes. is relatively undamaged. They didn't bother to dismantle uh, the State Department because they just ignored it. Right, and all those, you know, state has been losing influence for years right. over over administrations of both parties. Right, Heather. Yep. Oh, for a minute, I thought I'd lost you. Nope. Oh, um, still here. Sorry. Um, about that. What, here's an issue, though, and and I mean, again, this is this is this is related to question of why isn't the Democratic foreign policy establishment coming out swinging a little bit more uh, on an issue that I think resonates with the base, and on this one, I think not just with the base, but with a very broad, broad spectrum of people. Um, all of these issues of checks and balances and the rule of law, uh, uh, you know, torture, secret indefinite detention policies, uh, Bush administration's habit of uh, issuing uh, of signing statements on legislation that basically say, and we're going to ignore this, we're not going to veto, we're just going to we're just going to secretly ignore this legislation, uh, and we're going to we're going to attach a signing statement saying we reserve the right to ignore this legislation. Um, all of those things have been part of uh, an effort to both accrue power in the, legis in the executive branch, um, ignore the laws of the country, uh, and not just ignore the laws of the country, but but send a message that is completely antithetical to the basic notion of the rule of law, which, you know, and, and at its core, obviously, the rule of law is, is in part uh, an idea that says uh, one person, that, that you need a check, that you need some kind of check, that you, that you shouldn't have a president or a single party making all of the decisions without anybody else being able to say, hey, wait a minute, what about the evidence, what about this, what about that? And, and it seems to me that the Democratic leadership, uh, none of the candidates, has really been been making this as much of an issue as they should, given that my sense is that not only the Democratic base is very distressed about this, but lots of independents and indeed lots of Republicans really recognize that these are threats, not, not just to some kind of Democratic, big D, capital D, Democratic agenda, but to small D and small small-D Democratic and small-R Republican conceptions of what this country is supposed to be about? Well, I, I think there are two things in play. And one is just that even I find this subject really complex and technical and hard to frame mm -hmm. good sweeping arguments around. So it's not, it's not an easy subject to do in a rhetorical and campaign way. But the other point, which is probably more important, is that unfortunately 
this administration really grasped with both hands and, as I said, used, and you can look at the polling and kind of break out the chunk of the electorate that they were able to hold on to for a really long time, who identified after 9-11 their personal safety with right. Bush's effectiveness. And you can look at, um, back in 2004, Steve Cull at the University of Maryland did this great poll of confirmed Republican voters, people who had already decided right. in September that they were going to vote to reelect Bush. And the numbers on sort of, he takes care of me, he, you know, the right. real kind of father figure right. on security. Right. But those people had an incredibly high set of erroneous beliefs that Bush supported the... Um, International Criminal Court that Bush, so you would describe the International Criminal Court and they'd say, do you support that or not? And they'd say, yes, that sounds like a good idea. Right. Do you think President Bush supports that? Yes, he does. Describe Kyoto. Well, that sounds like a good idea. Do you think right. President... So Steve Cull's hypothesis about why this happened is that these are folks, and again, if this isn't the whole electorate and it's not a lot of Democrats, but it's a chunk mm -hmm. somewhere in the middle, mm -hmm. are folks who got really scared by 9-11 and sure. who, who really kind of personally identified their security with Bush. And so having once done that, it was too scary to unidentify. Right. And so those right. folks stayed with him for a long time. And you still have um, a lot of, I think, uncertainty on the part of people who look mm -hmm. at public opinion on kind of how far away those people have gone. And you, I don't you, even, I'm not, I, I mean, I accept that those people may be lost. You know, that there are people, but... But if that's 15% of the electorate, unfortunately... So, and the other thing, Rosa, I was going to say is that if you, again, look at public opinion polling, and it's, I think, completely conditioned by the way this administration right. has framed right. the national security debate for six years, but people have been led to believe that we have to give up rights in order right. to have security. But, that, but, but I but, think that's totally wrong, it's but totally you can't wrong, reverse but that in two why aren't, why aren't, why isn't Why aren't more people challenging it more effectively? I mean, I agree with you. I think... I think but I think that we have we have acceded too much to to their framing of the debate, and, and and I don't. I mean, to me, these aren't these aren't particularly technical issues. I mean, I think that I think it is actually not that hard to express these in ways that make a lot of sense. I mean, go you know, I I always say to people, go read the Declaration of Independence. You know, this is this is this is third grade civic stuff. You know, it says, look, let's say let's say that a person in charge says, um, I reserve the right. To, to capture and arrest and put in a locked cell any person at any time based on anything that I'm not going to tell you about. It's going to be a secret. It's going to be reasons that only I'm going to know about. And I'm not going to let that person, once they're locked in a cell, tell anybody that they're in a cell. I'm not going to tell their family that they're in a cell. I'm not going to let them talk to a lawyer or anybody else. Nobody will know that they're in a cell, and they'll stay in that cell as long as I want them to be in that cell, uh, and I'm going to do anything I want to them, and I'm not going to tell you what I'm going to do to them or what I won't do to them because it's a secret, and you just have to trust me, and that's the end of the story. You don't, you don't have to be a lawyer to see why that's dangerous, why that power is dangerous, and why it might not, you know, you know this, is, this is the standard, you know, first they came for the communists, and I thought, oh, well, you know, communists, whatever, and when they came for me, it was too late. You know, that, that, that you, it's not technical at all, that these issues, I think, are, are very direct and immediate, and, and I recognize that there are people who don't get it and never will get it, but I think for the, I, I, think, I think actually that we are seeing something that the democratic elites are, are actually not picking up on, which is that lots of people, including lots of independents and lots of Republicans, do get it and are scared by it. And it's an opportunity that is not being taken. I mean, I partly think this because, as you know, I write about these issues quite a lot. And every time I write about them, yeah, I get emails from people who say, you know, ha, 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 well, you'll be sorry when a terrorist bombs your house. And I think, well, you know, yeah, I would be sorry, but that's not really the point. Um, you know, but I also get unbelievable numbers of emails from people, uh, you know, this is not a scientific sampling, but from people say things like, I've been a lifelong Republican and I am scared out of my mind by the powers that this administration has claimed for itself, you know, which are the essence of tyranny. Well, one of the more encouraging things that's happened along these lines recently is, um, as you probably know, the administration has been up on the hill trying to weaken what protections there are under FISA. Yep. 
Um, and there was this amazing sequence of statements, starting with Heather Wilson of New Mexico, who, is, as you probably know, almost got beat last time um, and will be in a tight rematch again next time, who went to the floor and basically said, if there's another, I hope there's not another attack so we don't have to come back here and lay the blame at the feet of the Democrats for not um, allowing us to do the surveillance right. we need to do. Right. Uh, I mean, it was just, it was shocking to me that she did this. And then um, Mitch McConnell went to the Senate and did a very similar right. thing. And so it, it seemed very clear that the White House was kind of deliberately orchestrating an effort to ratchet up fear of exactly right. this kind right. of a sure. pushback. Absolutely. And then the Democrats didn't stand for it, right. actually. And, you know, and it was actually some of the more conservative Democrats, like Jane Harman, who went out and said, okay, you know, don't even think about trying this because we will push right back at you and we think you won't, we don't think you'll win anymore. So I actually think the change is happening on this. It's happening slower than you would like. And one of the reasons is that the, the prevailing orthodoxy that everybody heard from their political consultants for a long time was don't touch this. Right. And now that's changed. And as I said, nobody's quite sure how to interpret it. It's, the public is running ahead of the Democrats on yeah. some issues, not all issues, but some. And it's, it's very interesting um, frustrating, but also kind of fun and hopeful to watch. I mean, mm -hmm. more hopeful than I felt five or six years anyway. To to watch the party try to figure out, you know, gee, what do we do now that people actually agree with us? Right, right, and and right. Trust the Democrats to to immediately be so traumatized by that that they they quickly take on a set of positions opposite to the public just out of sheer habit. Um, <laughs> I, well, well, let's. I think we're we're running out of time, but we maybe have time for to talk about one last issue that that's a somewhat more personal issue for both of us, and actually cycles us back to something that we we, we touched on a little bit at the very beginning of this conversation uh, when we we were talking about democracy arsenal and the way. Uh, many of the bloggers associated with it see themselves primarily as policy people who, should there be a, a new Democratic administration, would would many of them would at least at some point in that administration see themselves as, as wanting at least to go and, and uh, take some interesting foreign policy or national security job. Um, let me talk about an issue that, that, that is actually common to me, to you, and to a couple of our, our other Democracy Arsenal bloggers, Suzanne Nossel, uh, uh, Laura Lai Kelly, uh, we're all women in, in our 30s with small children. Um, we all have uh, prior government experience uh, in national security and foreign policy areas. All of us, I think, I think at least some of the time when we're daydreaming, think, well, wow, wouldn't it be, wouldn't it be exciting to be able to be part of uh, a new democratic uh, executive branch in some way, shape, or form if we had that opportunity? Um, do you have... Do you, are we going to be able to do that? You know, we've got little kids. Uh, how do we do that? Is there is there room yet? You know, is is the world ready for women with small children in high-powered national security jobs? You know, um, Susan Rice, who you probably know was Assistant Secretary of State for Africa right. in the second Clinton term, had a toddler. Right. And... I, at that point, did not have kids, wasn't really expecting to have kids, was just married, and one of the most searing things I remember was her husband bringing the toddler and holding him up to the window of the bus to say goodbye when we would leave on these, you know, sort of two-week-long overseas right. trips. But Susan did it. And I think, you know, the thing that's challenging about this is everyone does it differently. And I think it's, you definitely can do, you know, um, Charlene Barczewski had school-age kids um, when she was running. Right, she got burned for trying to bring them back a beanie baby, unlawful beanie baby. Yeah, but yeah. she would close down USTR and take them to the beach for a couple of weeks every year in the mm -hmm. summer, and, and that was kind of her sacred time with them. Um, you know, I mentioned to you this article that was in the Post last week sort of profiling several women in Congress with, with very young children. So mm -hmm. I almost think the question is less, is the world ready for it, than on what terms are we going to do it? Because you or I or Suzanne or Lorelai could could all have hot national security jobs, you know, administration willing, but I have some qualms about the 80-hour work week that I didn't used to have. Right. Um, right. You know, but on the other hand, I, I don't, you know, I don't want a job. The, the, the truth about myself is I don't want a job I can do in 40 hours. I want an interesting job. I do. I want a job that I can do while wearing my pajamas and reading novels, actually. <laughs> um, as I have right now, a job that I can do in my pajamas and reading novels, except when there's a video camera involved. And, you know, you actually, 
I speak for stay-at-home professionals everywhere that you actually miss the water cooler and all the time you waste talking to people. The yeah, the grass is always greener. Yeah, yeah, that is basically true. But the something that I have to say is that I think the real thing that is changing and still needs to change more is that you have office environments where it's just expected and it's expected for parents of both sexes right. that you can integrate your family responsibilities with your work responsibilities. One of the things that I love, love, love about working for Senator Clinton is that it's often pretty simple to drop off the radar screen between, say, 6 and 8 p.m., which doesn't mean that she won't be up working until 2 in the morning afterwards. Mm -hmm. But in general, you know, and not always, I don't want to make it seem perfect. You put your toddler to bed. But you can say, look, you know, i got to put the kid to bed. You know, my husband is out. I'm cooking dinner right now. Um, You know, can we do the conference call at 4.30 instead of 5.30? And Mm -hmm. it's the kind of what I have really appreciated and a couple of other... um, I've worked, done some work for Pelosi, and I've done some work for Jane right. Harmon. And in each case, what I found made life so much easier was that you didn't have to pretend that the kids didn't right. exist. Right, right. No, and and I think, and when I think about uh, what, I, it would be one very exciting thing about having a, a woman chief executive would be would be not having to pretend that the kids don't exist anymore. And because one of the things, I mean, a common uh, common point that sometimes uh, people make when women say, well, the workforce is just not very friendly to me, is, is things like, well, look, if, if you don't, you know, if, if, if you aren't willing to work these crazy hours, uh, then, then don't. Don't have this job. Uh, wait till your kids are older or whatever. Uh, you know, why shouldn't we expect you to work these crazy hours? But, but the question that people often don't ask is, why are those crazy hours actually necessary? And in national security jobs, Granted, you know, if suddenly there is intelligence that the Russians are about to launch a nuclear weapon at the United States, well, everybody needs to be ready to drop yeah. whatever they're doing at that exact instant. But quite frankly, as you and I both know, that doesn't happen that often. That most, that both of us probably are all too aware that the vast majority of the, you know, Heather, we need you here right now, mm-hmm. were for garbage. But for we crap. sat at our desks in the State right. Department because yeah. our boss was still right. sitting absolutely. at his that there desk. Wasn't, it wasn't a yeah. national crisis. It was absolutely nothing that with with better planning or, frankly, no pl- you, know, you didn't need to be there. Yeah. You know, that they could have called you if a crisis came up. And you would, of course, come in if a crisis came up. Right. You know, you could have talked to people on the phone from home rather than from your office if a crisis yeah. had come up. You know, that, that, that there's this... Part, you know, part of this is that, that people like to feel important, so yes. they like to be there 16 hours a day because it makes them feel important to be there 16 hours a day, even though, in fact, you know, 98% of what they do could be done in eight hours a day if they were a little bit more efficient yeah. to begin with, and, and even if it's 16 hours a day, a lot of it could be done from home. And I, I, wonder, whether, I wonder whether we have gotten to the point under either, if there's a Democratic administration, under either a Hillary Clinton administration or perhaps an Obama administration or some other administration, either way, where, where we've advanced enough that people like you and like me and like the many other women of our generation with, with family responsibilities will be able to say without suffering career penalties, you know what, um, I'm going to be going home unless there's an emergency at 530 um, and, of course, if there's an emergency, I will come back in. And, of course, I will be available to take telephone calls and I'll be checking my email. Uh, but, you know, plan to get things that you need from me to me uh, before that time because I'll be going home. Um, you know, I wonder if we'll be able to do that or if we'll, we'll, or if we'll run into the same old but, 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 you have to be here. Well, why? Well, because. Well, why? Well, because. Because there might be something. Well, why not call me? Well, because you just need to be here because. Well, look, I think if we're honest with ourselves, Mm -hmm. one of the big problems is going to be that it's going to be 530, and you're going to, you know, look around your suite and know that you could perfectly well go home. Right. But that there are sort of five people in their early, late 20s, early 30s, who either don't have kids or are not the primary caretaker of the kids, or who, you know are not sort of actively trying to have a social life and who are very <laughs> eager for you to go home. And so you're, you're and they're going to be making me look bad. Yeah, and we're yeah. going to have to be able to handle that. And right. that is not something that you can legislate. That is something that we right. women, and again, I, I keep saying and men too, right. have got to deal with 
ourselves. And that, I think, is a, sort of a part of this whole thing that gets, that gets overlooked, that it isn't, right. it isn't the workplace's responsibility to mediate my ambition and my paranoia for me. I have to do that myself, and I have to mm-hmm. find the balance myself. But, but having said that, I also think the more of us do it, and I also think as we start to get into supervisory positions, the more we do it for our subordinates. Mm-hmm. And the more we say to the men, if we have male subordinates, the more we say to them, you know what, it's 6 o'clock, go home. Well, one of my favorite moments um, on the Clinton staff, actually, was the day I was trying to reach one of her male staffers, and he said, I want a parade with my kid. Let me call you later. Mm-hmm. And I was like, oh, because I really think that the more, I mean, at least for me, you know, sometimes I want my husband to be the one who races home at 5.30 so I can stay at work. Thank you very much. Well, but the one, one, one thing that Bush, that, that the Bush, Bush, George Bush himself and his administration have been, have been often mocked for, has been the number of vacations he takes and the rather short hours he, he appears to work. And I have to say, I, I sometimes think, um, Okay, granted, sometimes this daily schedule does look uh, perhaps a, a tad light for the President of the United States, but nevertheless, uh, you know, I, I, re- I remember reading some years ago a, a piece on how he, you know, he basically has said to people on his staff, um, look, we, we, you know, we don't start here at 5.30 in the morning, you know, I'm, I'm you know, I want my first meeting at 9, and my last meeting is going to be at 5, and, <laughs> and, and, and to some extent I think that, you know, obviously, yes, if things, crises that come up outside of those hours, you just have to deal with them outside of those hours. But that said, that there is nothing so terrible about setting the message that, you know, the goal of the workplace is to try to ensure that no individual human being has to be on a kind of round-the-clock schedule. You know, the White House has to be on a round-the-clock schedule, but that shouldn't mean that every single staffer has to be on a round-the-clock schedule and is getting four hours of sleep because people don't function very well that way. And, you know, that, that to some extent that that's something that, that trying to create a more humane workplace, one in which, in which even national security officials are actually sufficiently awake and alert to do their job effectively, uh, is not such a terrible thing. I mean, the other thing, however, that is true is that politics and national security both attract people who, for their own kind of internal reasons, need to work all the time. And so when, either because you have kids or because you meet someone you're really excited to spend time with or, you know, because you take up competitive bowling or or whatever, (laughs) you cease to be that kind of person, there is unfortunately a degree of of reassessment about how do I fit into this world. And I, I think that's what I perceive as being hard. You know, politics isn't going to, I'm not going to change politics overnight when I go in and say, you know what, I'm not staying here until 9 o'clock every night. And so that's, you can't, um, right. you get, there's nothing that can take that away. And I'd like to think that all, that all of us together could make politics somewhat better. But look, it's still going to draw crazy people in their 20s, 30s, and on up who just would rather be working than, and if we're right. honest, we'll both admit that we've had moments and, God, I hope I'll have them again where I'd rather be working than doing anything else, where it's just the most exciting, transporting thing there is. And if I didn't think I'd have moments like that, you know, I wouldn't bother. I'd stay in my pajamas and read novels all day. Moments. Moments. You just don't want the moments to eat up the rest of your life and eat up all the, all those good moments where you're, where right. you're holding the hands of a grubby little, yeah. little cute person. Uh, well, on that note, uh, la luta continua. Yeah. Um, and I think we're about out of time. Heather, uh, thanks, for, thanks for joining me. Oh, thank you, Rosa, for introducing me to this wonderful new world. Okay. Well, I, I hope that we'll have you back here again. Great. I hope to come back. Bye. Bye. Okay. And now we do our little one, two, two three, three click. Oops. Wait. I clicked the wrong thing. Let's try that again. You probably clicked off.